violence is a product, a service just like anything else. Goes to that kid's house, you're gonna go ahead first. You can sell violence just like one would sell toilet paper, for example. As long as there is a demand for violence, violence providers will gladly sell the service for a price. Except in a society like America, the government has a monopoly on violence. You can't hurt or kill another person except in self-defense. Only the government can. In fact, if you think about it, every ounce of power the government has comes down to the fact that they can legally murder you. FBI, don't move! Get in the back! Hey, hey. Right. Oh, no, no, no. Don't pay your taxes? Get fined. Don't pay the fine? Go to jail. Resist the rest? Get beat. Resist the beating? Eventually, everything comes down to the government killing you. And since the government has a monopoly on violence, if there's a need for violence in the marketplace, a demand for violence that the government isn't meeting, for example, maybe it's employers using violence to break up labor union strikes, and the government isn't doing anything about it. Those labor unions have a demand for violence that isn't being met. And when there's a demand in the marketplace that isn't being met because the government has a monopoly on it and isn't doing anything about it, or because it's prohibited, the black market and organized crime will come to the rescue. Because those people are the only ones that are willing to operate outside the boundaries of the law. That was true for prohibition? The mafia made a killing bootlegging alcohol? It's true today with drugs? Drug cartels make a killing boot liking drugs? And it was true for labor unions in America. Employers were using violence to break up labor union strikes, so labor unions needed violence to fight back against those employers. They weren't getting it from the government, so they turned to the only service provider that could provide violence. The Mafia and the Mafia gladly provided, sinking their teeth in, infiltrating these labor unions so much that they basically owned them, weaponizing labor unions into one of the Mafia's greatest and most lucrative weapons during their reign. This is Violence as a Service, how the Mafia weaponized labor unions. Where are we gonna go but up? We infiltrated every sector of society, from the guy on the street with the numbers business right up to the White House. Mm -hmm. You control the unions in this country, you control the country. Look, you control the Teamsters, you got two and a half million truck drivers, you call a strike, the country stops. Which? You call a strike at the docks, nothing comes in and out to of his. We had the um, uh, security union, right? We had, we had security at nine nuclear power plants in the country. Unions turned to the Mafia because they needed violence. Video creators and businesses looking to create videos on the other hand need a lot of other things. Stock videos, images, music, sound effects, animations. Hmm, if only there was a place that offered all those assets for instant download, all in one affordable subscription. Well, you're in luck because that's where Storyblocks comes in, today's video sponsor. With Storyblocks, instead of paying per download like what a lot of websites charge, you get unlimited downloads on everything you need to make great videos, so you can get the views, the clicks, the shares you want a lot faster. Basically, Storyblocks makes creating great videos a lot easier. And even if you're brand new to video editing, Storyblocks also offers an easy-to-use video editor that lets you add anything from their library directly to your edit, and then you can export your video in all the popular formats. To get started, go to storyblocks.com slash right now to sign up for their unlimited all-access plan with the link below. There is zero commitment and you can cancel whenever you want. That's storyblocks.com slash with the link in the video description below. If you were a skilled worker like a tailor, carpenter, or blacksmith in the 19th century, you were probably part of a labor union. Ah yes, our meager restitution. Ah, the sweet smell of payday. Basically, a labor union is an organization workers could join for a fee, and in exchange they would, in theory, get protection from the union against their employers lowering their wages, firing them for no reason, or to protect them from bad working conditions. One way unions could make sure their members were being treated fairly was through strikes. Krusty Krab is unfair! Mr. Krabs is in there! Standing at the concession! Plotting his oppression! The union's leadership would organize all the workers in a particular industry to get them to refuse to come to work for a day, a week, or however long it took to get their message across. In order for them to go back to work, employers would have to pay up. 
We've got to unite as workers and demand the respect we deserve from the boss. In fact, you and I should go on strike. One of the first strikes ever recorded happened in 1768 in New York, when workers started protesting against their salaries getting cuts. Suddenly, everyone saw the power of collective bargaining, and people started demanding things like better salaries and less working hours per day. For skilled workers, unions could perform miracles. This all seemed great for the mostly white, highly skilled tradesmen. But if you were an unskilled worker like a meat packer or construction worker, you were pretty much completely left out. It was the 1800s, and of course no one seemed to care that coal miners or industrial workers were being used for cheap labor. That was until the mid-20th century came along. After World War I, America saw a huge rise in the number of immigrant workers moving to the states, trying to escape the destruction back home. Most of them were uneducated and poor. At first, big businesses saw an opportunity for even cheaper labor. Here was an entire workforce willing to do the job for a fraction of the price. But not for long. Those uneducated immigrants realized pretty quickly that they were being cheated. So what did they do? They went on strike. And without workers to produce food or build machinery, entire industries came to a standstill. They had to give in to the workers' demands. And it was also after World War I that Prohibition came along. This changed everything for the American Mafia. It launched them into the stratosphere. In fact, I would argue that the American Mafia we know today would have never gotten as powerful as it was if it wasn't for the government banning alcohol. They were drowning in bootlegging cash, and it gave them the funds they needed to really expand and infiltrate every facet of American society for decades to come, with one of those facets being labor unions. All this power the unions wielded meant that by the end of World War II, more than 12 million American workers were unionized. And since collective bargaining only works when everyone is involved, when the entire collective is involved, if you were a worker in the 40s and you weren't part of a union, they would call you a strike breaker and you'd be on the receiving end of a lot of hate. <laughs> Employers obviously weren't exactly happy with these strikes, higher wages, and better working conditions, so to fight back, they needed to find ways to put an end to the strikes. The first strikes had come as a surprise. Employers weren't expecting workers to organize against them, and for a while there wasn't much they could do to stop the strikes and get them to come back to work. But of course the strike free-for-all couldn't last forever, and business owners turned to a reliable method they could always count on to get the job done. Violence. The people they brought in to end the strikes and protests were called strike breakers, or union busters, and their methods were brutal. One strike organizer named Frank Little was kidnapped in the middle of the night, dragged through the streets while tied to the back of a car, and hanged. With a note pinned to his leg that said first and last warning. All because he had gotten more people to join unions. And for union members who just participated in the strikes, some got arrested, some got beaten up, and some just disappeared. But as we all know, the only way to fight fire is with fire. So those poor and uneducated workers, many of them from Italy or Eastern Europe, decided to turn to their own for help, the mob. Sick and tired of being beaten and threatened because they were striking, union members decided to answer violence with violence. Union leaders went out and made deals with the mob and gangsters to protect them from their employers, and this led to utter chaos with one guy named J.B. McNamara claiming responsibility for 100 bombings against anti-union leaders across the country. The only problem was when the smoke cleared, most of the unions realized that once hired, mobsters were kinda difficult to get rid of. What were you gonna do, kick them out, intimidate them? In many cases, those mobsters decided to just take over the unions and use them for their own interests. These mafia-controlled labor unions would soon become one of their most powerful, influential weapons. When the unions came knocking at the Mafia's door for help, the mobsters saw an opportunity of a lifetime. The two things any good mafioso wants most in his life is money and power. And by joining and taking over unions, they could get both. By controlling a powerful union, you had number one, the power to shut down and extort businesses at your whim, and number two, all those millions of dollars being paid by union workers every month went directly into your pockets. To fund your lifestyle, to buy off more politicians, to invest in real estate and legitimate businesses, it was a cash cow. For the Mafia, if they weren't already part of a union after protecting them from their employers, these gangsters took control of the unions in pretty creative ways. Think of it like hostile takeovers, but with the Mafia and labor unions. They ran for office and rigged elections, they bribed their way to the top, and sometimes in the most Mafia way possible, they just walk into a union meeting, put a gun to the organizer's head, and say it's our union now. Mobsters uh, just simply walked into a union, put a gun to the head of a union official, and said, you know, it's our union, goodbye. 
The mafia took over so many unions that at one point, La Cosa Nostra had unions in every major city in the US. And what would they get from controlling unions? The possibilities were endless. Look, you control the Teamsters, you got two and a half million truck drivers, you call a strike, the country stops. Which? You call a strike at the docks, nothing comes in and out of To his point. Extort businesses. Unions were the perfect way to extort businesses for money or for favors. In restaurants, clubs, and bars with a lot of employees, one of the best ways to make money would be by threatening to unionize the workers. A mobster would basically go to the owner and say, if you don't pay us X amount of money, we're going to unionize all your employees. Or if the members of a union plan a strike, the mafia would go to the owner and say, if you want us to call off the strike, pay us X amount of money. Simple. Taking bribes. This extortion technique eventually became so well known that most mobsters didn't even have to go out and threaten anyone. The bribes from business owners would simply come in in advance. A bottomless bank account. But that wasn't all. Once a mobster took control of a union, he put all his friends and family on the union payroll and paid them crazy salaries. He could also steal as much money as he wanted from the treasury, basically using it as his personal never-ending bank account. Steal from pension funds. But all these benefits the mob got from joining unions didn't even compare to what they did with the union pension funds. Just like treasuries, pension funds run by unions could be used for whatever nefarious purpose the mafia had. And no union mob joint venture did this better than the Teamsters. Even today, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters is probably seen as the most corrupt union on earth. Right from the start, the organization was corrupted, and it only got worse in the 50s when Jimmy Hoffa took control. Jimmy was single-handedly responsible for turning Las Vegas into what it is today. He used most of the Teamsters' pension funds to support the building of more than eight casinos and hotels on the Strip in the 60s, including Caesars Palace. Unions gave the Mafia a chance to expand, get richer, and spread their influence like never before. It got to a point where you couldn't even tell the difference between unions and the mob. They were practically one and the same. Think about it. Most labor unions and even modern ones can be compared to a protection racket. Workers pay money every month or quarter, and in exchange, they get representation and protection. In some states, employees could even get fired for not paying, whether they wanted representation or not. With all the money and power the mob got from taking over unions, it seemed like this match made in hell was gonna last forever. But the glory days of the mafia came to a shattering end by the 70s. Like all good things, the marriage between the Mafia and labor unions eventually had to come to an end. Its downfall started with the introduction of the Racketeer Influence and Corrupt Organization Act, also known as RICO in 1970, which made it easier to arrest Mafia bosses and not just the low-level guys who did the dirty work. Jimmy Hoffa, the leader of the Teamsters, was sent to jail, and all five bosses from the main five Italian-American Mafia families were indicted. And with everyone getting arrested, the Mafia code of silence was basically thrown out the window. Everyone was snitching on everyone, hoping to get a better deal. And it didn't help that around the same time, unions started getting some serious political opposition, with Congress siding with employers on a lot of issues, and lobbyists spending millions to make sure unions were weakened and completely wiped out the face of the earth. What has seemed like an unbreakable partnership was left in pieces. Today, the Mafia is a shell of his former self. Most of the children and grandchildren of Mafia members are going to college to become doctors or lawyers, and no one is interested in rebuilding their parents' empires. And labor unions? Today, only 8% of salary workers are part of a union, and even the unions themselves are struggling to survive. At the end of the day, the Mafia infiltration of labor unions all came down to the need for violence that wasn't being filled. But once this need was filled and the world started changing too fast, the partnership broke down. But recently over in Australia, labor unions are showing that they can still be a force to be reckoned with. The truckers shut down the roads. They stopped on the bridges. They at all at the same time, they shut the country down. And within 24 hours, South Wales in Australia went from mandatory vaccinations to uh, non-mandatory to, to what do they consider? Well, it was uh, and it's legit. It has been a really long time since we've done a Mafia video. I missed them, so here we are. Let me know if you guys want more Mafia videos in the comments below. And if you're watching this and you're still not subscribed, we make video essays just like this one every single week for free on the most provocative stuff in the world of crime, like this video, money, power, and war. So click that subscribe button. You can always dislike and unsubscribe later, so just give it a try. If you want more behind the scenes stuff, day in the life kind of stuff, you can follow me on Instagram at jaketrend.io. That's gonna wrap it up for this video. Thank you so much for watching. You've been awesome. I've been Jake. Stay dangerous out there, and I will see you guys in the next one.